This presentation is for the IEEE Project 7010 Wellbeing Metric Standards for Ethical Artificial Intelligence and Artificial Systems, which you can find at www.standard.ieee.org slash develop slash project slash 710.html. This presentation is a synopsis of a document that we created as part of the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in Artificial Intelligence and Artificial Systems, and the document is called the State of Wellbeing Metrics and Introduction. And that's what this is. This is an introduction to how we define well-being. The object of this presentation is to sort of set the grounds for creating a glossary for defining well-being broadly and in a way that is relevant and helpful to the application of a well-being metric standard for the ethical development of artificial intelligence and artificial systems. The outcome of this presentation is the development of a spreadsheet in which we populate with the various definitions of well-being being employed in the sectors of business, government, NGO, spiritual, academic, and other sectors. To get involved in this Project 7010, or to learn more about it, you can go to the website aforementioned. A little bit about myself. I am the Executive Director of the Happiness Alliance. We've been active in the happiness movement since 2011 and 2010. We started developing our own index based on the one that Bhutan uses, which we'll touch upon in this presentation. I am very honored to be the vice chair of this project and very much looking forward to working with the people on the project and to developing this well-being metric standard. My work in the happiness movement is to spread knowledge and information about what happiness is in terms of how we measure it and how it is being employed by governments, communities, and others. You can find a lot of this information as well as actually have an experience of using a happiness index at happycounts.org. So let's go on with the presentation. Let's start with a few words about terminology. You see that we're using the term well-being. But you'll see, if you look at, for example, the World Happiness Report, which I'll talk about briefly, that they actually use the term well-being and happiness synonymously, and that's quite common. There is an effort to differentiate between the term happiness using subjective well-being indicators, which we'll talk about, and well-being using objective indicators. However, at this point in this movement, in this happiness or beyond GDP or well-being quality of life movement, there really isn't anything that we can say definitively is a difference between well-being, happiness, quality of life, and beyond GDP. And my suggestion and read of this movement is that rather than trying to be a reductionist, let's go ahead and embrace the complexity of what the well-being movement is. And let's use these terms in a way that overlaps and that allows for and maybe even celebrates the fuzziness of those overlaps. So let's just address one more aspect of these terms, which is the beyond GDP term. Beyond GDP is referring, of course, to gross domestic product. And this term comes from, to my knowledge, the European Union's Brain Pool Project, which is a great report. You can read that by just going EU a brain pool project, or if you go to our website at Happy Counts, you'll, you'll see a link to it on the community resources. But that report identifies the term beyond GDP as essentially synonymous with the happiness and well-being movement because of the kickback from the use of the term happiness. And we also will see kickback from the term well-being. So beyond GDP is saying let's use wider measures of well-being, and that sort of comes from the uh, report called the Stieglitz Report. But enough on the history, let's go on with terminology. So you see here that there's a visual representing a definition of well-being, and this comes directly from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's very important document, Guideline for Measuring Subjective Well-Being. And you'll see here that there's three buckets for defining well-being. 
One is satisfaction with life. That's that really important reflective question. And that is including the conditions of life. And we'll see how those conditions of life are being measured by the OECD. They're also being measured by Gallup in their World Poll. And Bhutan, they call them the domains of the gross national happiness. So there's another bucket, which is affect, which we would just call feelings. And there's positive affect, or positive feelings, feelings that we generally want, and negative affect, or feelings that we generally avoid or would not hope for our, our loved ones. And then there's a third bucket, which is eudaimonia, or flourishing, sometimes called thriving. And those are questions that are about meaning, about purpose, about optimism, and many different aspects of eudaimonia. So this definition is coming from the OECD. And if you remember, which I'm sure you do, that the OECD is actually the organization that measures and compares countries' gross domestic product. And in the OECD around um, 2007, they sort of cut wind of this idea, and then it wasn't until 2011 that they started really taking some big steps about the importance for governments to use wider measures of well-being, and that GDP really wasn't a sufficient measure for governments governing for the well-being of their people. So before we go on, I just want to show you how the OECD is displaying and how you can play with those wider measures of well-being with their Better Life Index. And here is an, an example of how you can show how your values are going to have an outcome on what you measure. And um, this is a fun little game that you can play on the OECD Better Life Index website where you can find out which country you're best suited to live in depending on what your values are. Another effort that the OECD guidelines on measuring subjective well-being is having a formative impact on is the World Happiness Report. And there you'll see that they directly reference these guidelines. So now you've gotten a little bit of history of the happiness movement, just a tiny bit, and a couple of examples of where this is having an effect with international non-governmental organizations or NGOs. So let's go on. We briefly addressed the difference between objective and subjective measurements when we talked about terminology. And I think it's worth spending just a little bit of time exploring this or just touching on this. So we know that objective measures for well-being could include aspects such as life expectancy, income uh, inequality or income equality, depending on how you see it, high school dropout rates, etc. And that subjective measures are essentially surveys. So one is something that can be measured objectively, can be seen and counted, and the other is a question that you ask. And we also know that science has proven that the best way to find out how somebody feels about something or how somebody thinks about something is to ask them. What's important here, I think, is that it's not an either or an or. It's not that we either use objective measures or we must use subjective measures, but that we need both to get a balanced picture. And really, to get a balanced picture, we really do need both. A really good example is the issue of crime. If people are perceiving crime to be very high, a subjective measure, and crime really is high, then that's one policy implication and that's one personal action implication that is indicated there. However, if crime is perceived to be high and crime is actually very low, then we can see clearly that that is a very different policy implication and a very different personal action implication. So that's just one sort of typical example. Now let's just look at subjective measures. Um, what's the difference? We talked about those three buckets and in terms of how we could use them. So satisfaction with life is a reflective question. I'm sure you're aware of the work that Daniel Kahneman did that he got a Nobel Prize for. That when he was saying that satisfaction questions, because they're reflective, they cause you to think a bit. So if an example of a satisfaction question would be something like if I asked you, are you satisfied with your job? You'd have to think a little bit. Now those questions are important. They're very important to policy and decision makers because they tell you what kinds of actions people are most likely to take. 
If you say you're really not satisfied with your job, your boss probably wants to know because that means that you're probably going to be looking for some other kind of work. So that's where those reflective questions are really important for decision makers. Now, affect questions, or how are you feeling, those are questions that you don't have to pause and think about, right? If I ask you how are you feeling right now, you can say miserable or awesome. That's going to tell us how this certain setting or this certain situation that you're in is affecting you. If you say awesome, then you probably love watching YouTube videos. If you say miserable, then maybe listening to somebody talk not the best thing for you. You can see how this kind of information can be really useful for urban designers or for other people who want to understand how an environment or a situation is going to impact somebody. And last, eudaimonia. You meaning good, and daimon is the word for spirit. So you could think of it as like having a good soul or a good spirit or being in a place that really feels like it's giving you uh, the best situation for the best of you. This is really good information for understanding what really motivates people, what it is that really gets people to the point where they're feeling like they are at their highest self. And this will address again when we talk about the use of subjective well-being metrics in terms of positive psychology. And now we're going to look at some of the different ways that well-being is being measured. Now I mentioned before that this is coming right out of the document that we wrote, the State of Well-Being Metrics for that IEEE committee. So we're going to look at four different categories, positive psychology, the government and non-governmental sector, the business sector, and then what we're calling crowdsourced. We'll build on these for our document for the IEEE P7010 project. So let's start with positive psychology. Now the field of positive psychology, like the well-being or happiness movement, is relatively new. But that doesn't mean that its genesis is, is new. We've all heard of Maslow. Maslow was the first one to really say, to our knowledge, to really say that the psychology field or the psychiatry field is so focused on what's wrong. Let's look at what's right. And from that came with uh, the advent of Martin Seligman, working with Csikszentmihalyi, the author of Flow, came this birth in the entire psychological field of focusing on what's right. Or what is it that makes us happy? What are the conditions of our lives? What are our habits and the different things that we can do on our lives that um, can increase our happiness, and then of course, what is the impact of our genetic set point? And those are fuzzy, those how those three work together. So one of the ways that we can know and research how we can become happier or how we can have more well-being or more mental health rather than mental illness is through collecting data and then analyzing that data. So that data is collected through subjective well-being indicators or surveys. And you can see all kinds of surveys that are being used in the positive psychology field. This is a list of some of the areas that are being measured by the University of Pennsylvania project headed by Martin Seligman. And you'll see, if you're familiar with the field of eudaimonia, that a lot of these are really measuring aspects of those human needs, of those higher human needs, or self-actualizing human needs, or aspects of what today we would call flourishing. You'll also see some overlap here in terms of the conditions, um, the conditions of life, and also the area of satisfaction with life. And that's why I think it's so important to allow for the fuzziness in the sense of how we're defi defining well-being, because it's already there. And if we try to become too reductionist at this point, we're going to miss the point. So in conclusion on the area of positive psychology, if you were to go to the University of Pennsylvania's Authentic Happiness website, you would be able to take all of these different surveys and get a pretty good idea of how happiness or well-being or quality of life is being measured in the positive psychology field.
So let's go on to the government sector. Now we're calling this the government sector, but really we should be calling this the NGO, non-governmental organization and government sector, because a lot of the NGOs are having a big impact on how governments are measuring well-being. We're going to look at one example of that, and this is an objective component index, meaning that it's taking several different single, single indices and combining this to have a component index. This is the Human Development Index, and here you can see how it's taking objective indicators. And it's using this single index to report on different countries, and this information is being used by the United Nations and other entities to identify policies as well as interventions for different peoples in different countries. Now let's look at another objective indicator another component objective indicator, and that's the Genuine Progress Indicator. So the Genuine Progress Indicator is a project that started in the 90s. Um, a lot of energy went into it, and then it sort of petered out. And then it took a huge resurgence when governments, including Maryland and the United States, and Finland and others, started using the Genuine Progress in lieu of GDP, or primarily economic indicators, for measuring the success and for guiding governments. So what the Genuine Progress Indicator does is it takes the gross domestic product and it makes adjustments. So it's essentially it's taking out the bads, like cost of pollution, crime, these kinds of things that we know when they happen, they actually increase GDP, like an oil spill. And then it's adding in some of the goods, like volunteering, uh, taking care of your children. And then it's normalizing or adjusting for some of the long-term investments that normally go into one year's GDP. So that's the Genuine Progress Indicator. Now we've looked at two, and you can see the span of what these measure measurements are measuring. Let's look at one more metric, and that's how the Sustainable Development Goals are being measured by the United Nations. Now, I feel really sad to say that the SDGs are not including, including subjective measures because, um, to my understanding, there is a sense that it's a versus, not an and. Nevertheless, it's important to look at the SDGs because of, again, the span here of what's being measured, the, the width of what's being measured. And if you look at this and if you've had um, any interactions in the sustainability movement, which I'm sure you've, you've had, you'll see that here when we talk about well-being, when we talk about sustainable development, that we're seeing a marrying, we're seeing an overlapping of human conditions and the environment, or what some people would think of ecological or environmental sustainability. And that's important. It's important that we see that there is this interconnection, that things are, in a sense, fuzzy in many different ways. Okay, so now you have an idea of the landscape of objective measures for well-being or happiness or quality of life uh, beyond GDP. Now let's look at one of the ways or a couple of the ways that happiness, well-being is being measured subjectively or through surveys. And the first that we need to look at is Gallup. Now Gallup is a for-profit business and they are providing their data to many nonprofits, NGOs, as well as to governments. If you look at what Gallup is measuring with their world poll, you're going to see that there's quite a bit of overlap between what the SDGs measure and between when we look at the United Kingdom and when we look at Bhutan and how they are measuring happiness or well-being, that this actually is pretty comprehensive. There's quite a bit of um, direct overlap, so you're going to see work, you're going to see the environment, you're going to see the economy, etc., in direct overlap. And then there's some aspects that one measurement will include that another one might not. And that, again, is where we should take a note and see that we need to um, really look at this in an encompassing and wide way. So let's jump over to the United Kingdom and see how their Office of National Statistics started measuring happiness and well-being and portraying it. This is an old graphic that they used, which unfortunately, in my view, they no longer use. But it is sort of their wheel of well-being, their measures of national well-being. And you can see here again that there is a linking, that you can see that there is an understanding that all of these different domains or conditions are aspects of our well-being. 
and they use subjective and objective together. So in the economy, you're going to see uh, income for individuals, and of course that's an objective measure. And then in well-being, you're going to see measures of life satisfaction, an aspect of eudaimonia, so that's worthwhileness, feeling worthy. And then um, aspects are two different measures for affect, positive happiness, and negative anxiety. To finish off the government and non-governmental sector, let's look at how Bhutan, that country that is above India and next to Tibet and Nepal, are using and measuring happiness, or what they call gross national happiness. And you'll see here that they are widely measuring happiness and well-being, that they, if you looked more closely or looked at grossnationalhappiness.com, you would see that they use both objective and subjective measures. And they use this data to inform their policy, to inform their five-year plan, and to measure the outcomes of their policy and their five-year plan. So they are the one country in our, in our world that is actually using a happiness or well-being metric in lieu of a primary reliance upon economic metrics. Let's turn to the business sector. Here we're going to look first at the Global Reporting Initiative. And you'll see here that the way that the Global Reporting Initiative is measuring sustainability is very much like what the United Nations SDGs are looking at and has some overlap with what Gallup, as well as the United Kingdom, and even Bhutan are measuring. The Global Reporting Initiative today is used by most of the Fortune 500 companies and includes metrics for each of these different areas for companies to report on. These reports are some kind, sometimes called sustainability reports, they're sometimes called corporate social responsibility reports, and they have many other names. Nevertheless, it's important to look at the GRI, or the Global Reporting Initiative, because it's really helping to define what wider measures of sustainability, which in my view is the flip side of well-being and happiness, is in terms of how we measure it and how we manage it. Another effort it's worth looking at when we're looking at how do we measure well-being in a wide way is B Corp. Now, B Corp is a group that works with businesses to help them understand how to have a wider impact that encompasses the economic impact, but also community and the environment. And you'll see here that while their measure of well-being or success is much wider than just profit, it's not as wide as, for example, even the GRI, or certainly not as wide as the UK's ONS well-being um, metrics, or looking at Gallup and other metrics. Nevertheless, these two efforts are worthy to take note of because businesses actually are starting to use these metrics not only to manage and measure their performance, but also to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. So the fourth and last category that we will look at in terms of how do we define and measure well-being is what we'll call crowdsourced. So some might call this big data, but we're not going to go into big data because there are so many issues around um, big data. Instead, we're going to look at two different ways that I think are really exciting in the way that well-being is being defined and measured in a what I would call crowdsourced way. So the first is an app, which of course is probably the first thing that came to mind for you. Um, this app I think is really cool. It's a project that started in the United Kingdom called Mappiness. It started quite a while ago, around 2011. So it's quite a while ago in this field. And what it is is you download an app. It you tell it to, to ask you um, a certain amount of times during the day, once a day, 10 times a day, how happy you are, you put that data in, and then it'll give you a report of where your where your happiness and then how are you happiest, and then um, they publish reports that tell us where for the most part people are are happiest. And in their last report, they found that people are generally happiest in in the environment in a natural environment setting. So now this is a measurement of affect and we can see how important this data would be for example an urban planner. 
And the last example that we're going to look at comes from Dubai, and I think this is really fascinating. This is where, um, in Dubai, government services, and that's a uh, majority of services in Dubai, it's a different structure of government than in um, in the Western world. So the government in Dubai is asking people to do this survey. It's essentially a very, a very brief three-point survey about how they felt about various services that are provided and that they enjoy. And this data is being used by the service providers. So it's a really sort of turning government services on its head. And I think this is very innovative and very interesting. Of course, we have some feelings about that. Are we being observed or are we going to be punished if we find that we are unhappy, for example, with, uh, with taxes? Um, but it's also, I think, something to really take note of. And I had asked, I was at the, at a, the World Government Summit, um, and I had asked one of the people there if this was private, if people did feel they would um, perhaps be punished, and they, they assured me that it was. We'll see. I think this is something to really take note of and to look at how Dubai and the United Arab Emirates is measuring happiness and how they will use this. They have um, one of the first happiness ministers, how they will use this in government. And um, it'll be interesting because the government and private sector uh, are a bit overlapped there. So I think this is a really interesting case to to keep in mind. So I hope now, after having watched this presentation, that you have a good idea of the landscape of how well-being, happiness, quality of life beyond GDP is being measured, of some of the ideas of the different sectors of it, and that you agree, I hope, that it behooves us in this Project P7010 to broadly define well-being, at least at first, and um, to look at how we can use all of these different ways that we're defining well-being in our world to inform us in this project. Here are three different ways to find more information. If you're already part of the IEEE P7010, there's a folder with lots of information and documents about how well-being is being measured and who is measuring well-being. If you're not and want to join, then please do. If you don't want to join, you can go to happycounts.org and go to my uh, community toolkit, and there you'll find three different documents that I wrote that go into who's measuring happiness, how they're measuring happiness, and who's having an impact on measuring happiness and well-being. And then third, we have the State of Wellbeing Metrics document that we created for the IEEE Wellbeing Committee. So thank you, and have a lovely day.